Good afternoon. Today we're gonna get acquainted with CNV, the contingent negative variation. CNV was first discovered by Gray Walter and has attracted a lot of attention from other researchers. A description of Walter's work can be read in his book The Living Brain, published in English. We'll now go into more detail about this experiment. Two types of stimuli were used. One of them was audible, a click, and a second later, a second stimulus was given. It was a series of rhythmic flashes unpleasant for the subject. The first stimulus, an audible click, caused a nervous system response. Actually, an evoked auditory potential, an evoked potential that occurred after the stimulus was given. Then, a series of flashes by itself, without any instructions, also resulted in generating a certain evoked response to the rhythmic stimulation. A second passed between stimuli, and this pattern was observed when the subject didn't receive any instructions and just passively perceived the presented stimuli. But the situation changed dramatically when the subject received the next task. He could stop the unpleasant presentation of flashes. By pressing a button. In this case, the first stimulus took on a very different meaning. It became a warning. The first stimulus warned the subject that in a second there would be a second stimulus to respond to. The second stimulus flashes became an imperative stimulus. In this case, in the recorded potentials, the following reaction was observed. First, after the stimulus was given, there was an auditory response the same way as before. But after that, somewhere in 200 milliseconds after the warning stimulus was given, the potential began to slowly deviate to the negative side. It meant that a contingent negative variation developed which lasted until the imperative stimulus appeared, flashes, which the subject could react by pressing a button and terminating their presentation. In this case, there was a sharp decline in the negative deviation potential. After that, everything went back to the zero line. It is this negative deviation obtained in this experiment that Gray Walter called the E wave, expectancy wave. That's what we call contingent negative deviation. I should say that the contingent negative variation persists and develops steadily as long as the subject maintains a certain level of attention and performs the task, presses the button. Moreover, if we push back the presentation of flashes by increasing the interval between the warning and imperative stimulus, the CNV will also last much longer. In young people with the sanguine type of temperament, the contingent negative variation can even last up to 10 seconds. When the interval between stimuli increases, the CNV is well distinguished by two components. An earlier component, the so-called O-wave, and a later component, the E-wave. The O-wave follows the warning stimulus. It is associated with the indicative response and is more pronounced in the frontal areas. The E-wave precedes the imperative stimulus and is associated with the expectation and preparation of a modal response. This component is more pronounced in central and post-central areas. It should be noted that CNV also occurs in those experiments in which the subject is not required to perform any motor response, 
such as pressing a button, but only to mentally imagine this action or to mentally solve some other task. This allows the CME to be used as the control signal in a brain-computer interface. By increasing the amplitude, patients can mentally type text, select objects of interest on the screen and turn various devices on or off. So, for example, in this study, the subjects had to change the color of the balls from gray to green in the order of their numbers. First the color of the first ball, then the second, then the third, and so on. Also, it was not necessary to press any button. All these actions had to be done mentally. And the subjects chose the object of fixation they needed. For example, the first ball, which was originally gray. The gaze was set on the selected object. And then the test subject waited for the ball color to change. During this period, the subject had a registered change of potential, which became more and more negative. In this case, the negative value is located at the bottom of the scale. When the negative potential shift, the contingent negative deviation reached some threshold levels and exceeded them. The corresponding command in the brain-computer interface triggered, and the subject received a feedback signal. The ball's color changed. It became green, and immediately after that there was a C and V decrease. It should be noted that the contingent negative variation is an event-related potential. It has to do with very different processes than just the response of the nervous system to an incoming stimulus, auditory or visual. In this case, we deal with completely different processes. It is the expectation of making a decision, the initiation of an arbitrary movement, its motivation, and of course, attention. Under conditions of increased motivation, such as monetary reward, the wave amplitude can increase almost twofold. And of course, with various attention or motivation deficits, there is a decrease in CNV. CNV can be used in clinical studies, in the examination of patients with psychiatric and neurological diseases. For example, decreased CNV levels in amplitude are seen in illnesses such as schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety disorders. A change in CNV can also be observed in patients with neuralgia and migraines. In this study, CNV was recorded in healthy subjects who constituted a control group in patients with bipolar 1 disorder and patients with schizophrenia. The control group in the interval between the warning and imperative stimuli, a contingent negative variation was formed, the amplitude of which reached 20 microvolts or more, while in patients with psychiatric disorders, the CNV amplitude significantly decreased in cases with both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. In migraines, on the contrary, the CNV amplitude increases significantly between attacks, exceeding the values characteristic of the control group. It allows CNV registration to be used in the differential diagnosis of different headache types. For example, in the case of tension headaches, when CNV amplitudes remain comparable to the same values that are characteristic of the control group of subjects. CNV can also be used in the examination of patients with movement disorders, such as Parkinson's disease. In this case, the late CNV component, the E wave, is particularly affected, which changes as the disease progresses decreasing significantly in patients with late-stage Parkinson's disease. CNV topography is limited to the frontal and central areas, including the frontal, associative, motor and somatosensory cortex. Therefore, when recording a contingent negative deviation, we need the following leads. We'll be placing electrodes in the frontal area, 
These will be F3, FZ, and F4 leads. In the central area, these will be C3, CZ, and C4 leads. And in the parietal area, these will be P3, PZ, and P4 leads. Altogether, they will give us a complete picture of the CNV spread across the scalp. During installation, we will use a unipolar lead circuit. That means we need to install reference electrodes, which will place on the electrically neutral points ear lobes. These will be the A1 and A2 leads. Also, we shouldn't forget about the grounding electrode, which will be located on the center line, more frontal to the FZ lead. The CNV test is in the Neurovisor ERP module. To select a test to change the examination parameters, you should open the window with the scenario settings by clicking on the button located in the upper right corner of the screen. Next, we can select the appropriate test. There are two versions of the CNV test. The classic Gray Walter version, in which the warning stimulus is an audible tone and the imperative stimulus is a flickering image on the screen. The second version of the CNV test is completely audible there. And the first warning stimulus will be audible. It will be a sound tone and the second stimulus will also be a sound. You can turn off this annoying sound by pressing a button. In the scenario settings, you can select a sound volume comfortable for each participant in the study. This value can be changed and checked. At the bottom of the scenario settings window is an edit button that, when clicked, brings up four tabs. Test info, calculation, arrangement and filters. The first tab contains a description of the test we will perform. In the calculation tab, we can set the threshold of artifact amplitude, the calculation segment and the analysis stage we will use to highlight CNV. Also, we can set the confidence interval of the button that the subject will press and the random stimulus delay. In the arrangement tab, we can select the necessary lead scheme. The default setting is a unipolar scheme for nine leads, which we will use today. The filters tab it helps to set the necessary bandwidth for the CNV registration. Because CNV is a slow potential shift, we have to either turn off the high pass filter completely, or if that option doesn't exist, set its values as close to zero as possible. In our case, it is 16 thousands of a hertz. Keep in mind that at these values of the high pass filter, we miss all slow oscillations, not only CNV but also such artifact signals as galvanic skin response. Therefore, we should pay attention to the room temperature. CNV registration can be difficult in a hot room. After the presets, we go to the start screen of the selected test. This screen shows a schematic representation of a person's head, with the electrodes to be installed. We will use an MCS cap textile helmet with white and yellow fixation rings, which will be placed over the corresponding areas according to the international 10-20% to system to install the electrodes. These helmets come in different sizes. It can be selected considering the individual characteristics of the subject participating in the study. Place the helmet on the head of the study's participant. Fix it. We should pay attention to where the locking rings will be located. 
They should be exactly above the branches that we will install according to the previously discussed plan. Now, let's move directly to the installation of the electrodes themselves. We will use non-polarizable chlorine silver electrodes. Before installing and fixing the electrode with a fixing ring, we will have to clear the skin from the hair and all the leads used. Next, we should degrease it, then treat it with a special scrub. Place conductive gel on the location of the electrode and then install the electrode itself. We'll start by setting up the CZ electrode. We clear the hair. Degrease the skin surface. Let the alcohol dry. Now with a special abrasive scrub, we treat the top layer of skin to reduce resistance. Add an electrically conductive gel. Then we fix the silver chloride electrode. Now we can connect this electrode to the amplifier in the appropriate CZ connector. The next electrode we'll install will be the grounding one. We repeat all of our operations again. Clear the place under the electrode from the hair. Degrease it. Treat it with a scrub. Add an electrically conductive gel. And fix the electrode. Next, we connect the connector to the amplifier, signed as ground. When recording evoked potentials and event-related potentials, it's very important to achieve a low sub-electrode resistance. The color coding that we can see on the schematically displayed scalp, where we place the electrodes in the software, will help us with this. When resistance is low, each electrode will be indicated in green. If the resistance is higher, the color will either be orange or red. In this case, we need to carefully check all the procedures we have just performed. Perhaps there is hair left under the electrode, or the skin has not been treated well enough with a scrub, or not enough gel. We need to add it in this case. As soon as the color changes to green, you can move on to the next steps. Similarly, we set up all the other electrodes. Also, during the examination, we need headphones through which we will give sound signals to our subject. These would be warning stimuli. The remote control, which will be used by the subject to press the button in time to stop the unpleasant flickering images. 
And we should also make sure that we have the VGA Sense light sensor connected, which will be triggered every time the screen lights up. It will give a marker that will be recorded along with the electroencephalogram. All these devices must be connected to a special unit, as team. When installing reference ear electrodes, we perform all the same operations. Now we install the second ear electrode on the right side, A2. Degrease the skin with alcohol. Treat it with a scrub. Add gel to the electrode surface and fix it with a clip to the earlobe. Then we connect it to the amplifier. After installing all the electrodes, we should fix them by putting them together and securing them with a special retainer. This will reduce the contribution from artifacts related to the subject's movements and wire swing. This retainer can be attached to the helmet. There is an appropriate part here that it attaches to very well. We can also additionally staple the rest of it. So we are now in the program window where we will register on the diagram. All the electrodes we have installed are located there so we can see that we have achieved good contact. Each of them is indicated in green. That means we can move on to further registration. Before we begin the first period of training, during which our subject will learn to perform all the basic actions, we should note that by default only 30 presentations of the warning imperative stimulus are set in the scenario settings. Given that we may encounter various artifacts that will be represented by blinks or some slow deviations associated with wiggling wires, we'd better increase the number of trials, the number of presentations to 50 right away. Now we've switched to the window that displays the electroencephalogram. Given that we register with a bandwidth in which the HPF is 16,000 of Hertz, it's indicated here, then we'll have to wait before all channels are centered. Now we can see that this is a 9-channel electroencephalogram recording, it's unipolar everywhere as we can see. A pair of electrodes contains a reference ear or a combined ear electrode for the electrodes located along the center line. So now all channels, as we see, are gradually moving to the conditional zero line. We can now move on to the learning phase. There will only be three trials, three pitches of warning and imperative stimuli. The appropriate instructions will be shown on the patient's screen. At this stage, we check whether the subject performs all the actions correctly. Does the subject press the button? Do we get signals about the appearance of warning and imperative stimuli? If everything is fine, we can move on to the main stage, the experimental stage. Right, our experiment has started. We are now seeing an electroencephalogram recording on the screen. What periodically occurs at these high amplitude deviations, especially pronounced in the frontal F3, F4 and FZ leads, 
are the artifacts associated with blinks. It's important that these blinks are performed between samples and do not affect the analysis stage that we'll use for averaging. Let's pay attention to those stimulus markers that we record along with the electroencephalogram. We can see that there are three markers. The first marker is the presentation of a warning sound stimulus. The second marker is the appearance of a flickering image on the screen, which stops very quickly when the subject quickly and carefully presses the button on the remote control. Now we're going to combine the two screens, and in the lower right corner we can see what's displayed on the patient's screen. We can see that the flickering image is interrupted very quickly because the button is pressed. I remind you that it's the marker that appears after the sound stimulus mark. The contingent negative variation that we're going to analyze develops between the two stimuli, the warning and the imperative. But in a single analysis stage, we may not see it when recording an electroencephalogram. If we switch to another mode, where the average responses are displayed, the picture will change. We'll see the marker corresponding to the warning stimulus S1, a dashed vertical line. Then we'll see the marker corresponding to the imperative stimulus, a flickering image on the screen. It's the S2 marker. The first stimulus elicits in an auditory response which we see as potential deviations. Just like a flickering image, it causes a visual response in the nervous system. We can see that in between these two stimuli, immediately after the auditory evoked response, a slow negative deviation begins to form that increases until the flickering image appears, to which our subject reacts by pressing the button and the negative potential deviation drops sharply to the zero line and turns into positivity. Now we have scored quite a large number of stages. We can see that 45 sets of stimuli were presented. Now we've already moved, 44 stages have been averaged. This means that some of them haven't been processed. Perhaps due to the emergence of artifacts in the analysis stage. After the study, a PDF report is generated, which includes several pages. Here we can find a general description of the test, the equipment indications, and registration parameters. Also, here is a summary graph of the wave responses, in all the leads that were used. A summary histogram of the patient's responses, showing the distribution of response times and indicating the average response time when the button is pressed. Also in the PDF report, we can find amplitude maps with the distribution of various components on the scalp. A separate page contains averaged potentials from the test and a fragment of the electroencephalogram. If we click on the View Details button, a file with the recorded electroencephalogram and the average evoked responses will be downloaded. We are now looking at the example of another subject who took the CNV test. Here we can see a greater contribution of the various artifacts that show up in the electroencephalogram. These include the oculomotor and myographic artifacts that are present in the recording, as well as slow oscillations we record because our bandwidth was close to zero. The high-pass filter was set to 16 thousands of hertz, so these slow oscillations constantly show up in the recording. Due to the presence of such artifacts and other signals, 
that contribute to the recorded potentials, not all stages of analysis will be included in the averaging, and some of them will be removed during averaging. To make sense of what we are seeing here and where the stimulus presentation occurred, we can look at the vertical lines. The green vertical line indicates which pair of stimuli are presented and which trial it is. Its number is indicated here. What follows are vertical gray lines. These are the markers of the first warning stimulus, the second imperative stimulus, and finally, the last gray vertical line is the marker indicating what happened, the button press. And such trials are marked all over the electroencephalogram recording. We can switch to another mode and output average responses. In this case, the overall CNV trend will be more obvious because now we see the response averaged over 43 stages of analysis. We can bring out any of the leads and observe the development of sensory responses and CNVs in it separately, like we're doing now for the F3 information. Or we can bring out a summary graph of all the wave responses simultaneously. In some cases, it's more convenient. Here we can set the leads we need by turning them off completely and displaying the ones we're interested in. So, for example, we can match the responses that arise in two hemispheres, right and left, displaying them on the same graph and observe the coincidence of sensory responses as in the response that arises to the warning stimulus, and then the bilateral development of a contingent negative variation that lasts throughout the interval between the warning and imperative stimuli, we can derive average potentials for the frontal, central, and parietal leads which are in the same left hemisphere. We can also observe how the topography of these responses changes. Thus, for example, in the frontal and central leads, the sensory response arising to the warning stimulus is clearly visible, whereas the sensory response arising to the flash activation will be better seen in the parietal leads, which are closer to the occipital areas and therefore the visual cortex.